Hey everybody, welcome back to Reach Out Reptiles. My name is Garrett Hartle, and this week we're actually going to take you guys on the road to a breeding partner of ours. We're actually going to cover some specific information on tracking the progress of your females during breeding season and a little tip for the best possible success. I think you guys are going to like this one and be sure to stick around to the end for a special message on a great way that you guys can actually get involved helping to conduct some scientific research and have some fun along the way. So here we are at Metcalf Reptiles in Norfolk, Nebraska with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Aaron Metcalf. Hey guys. You guys know Aaron if you've been watching the channel for a while. We've actually done two Talk em Up Tuesdays with him, but just in case you haven't been watching a while, here's the first one and there's the second one. So those are pretty cool to watch um, and you can kind of get to know a little bit more about Aaron and who he is and what he's doing over here. But actually Aaron and I work together on a lot of Superdorf projects. So one of like my iconic breeders, I know the, the, you feel the same way about him, is Travis Kubis. Absolutely. Aaron, you actually used to work for him when you were a kid, yeah. stripping cages and stuff. Oh yeah. I, you were the old Aiden. What's up guys? I was, I was the old Aiden. At 14 years old, I met him and my dad dropped a, just a, a line to him like, hey, if you want extra help, my boys would love to come clean for you. And then I was back the next Saturday cleaning cages and I did that for about three years. So that's really what got me into retakes. Well, the cool thing is now you've actually, you started buying a couple of animals from Travis. It's kind of cool to see Aaron go from being Aiden. What's up? To now Metcalf Reptiles. You've got this whole shop. So I was sitting with Aaron and I said, I'm not going to do another Talk Em Up Tuesday with you because I think if I talk you up anymore, your head will get even oh, bigger please. than it is and oh, it won't please. fit this fancy hat that I gave you from the U.S. Archives. You did. <laughs> Instead, I said, what do you think we should talk about? You want to tell them what you said? There was a gaping hole of information on all my free tip Fridays. Yeah, the one thing I said is, Garrett, there's no videos out there on how to breed the retics. So details in systems, it's so key. So what I did was I got a binder and it's full of, of page after page after page um, of notes on my animals. Oh, dude, check this out. So Travis Kubis actually drew me this page when I first was starting to play around with breeding retics. I was like 16 years old. So this page is like seven years old now. Um, or six, six years old, it's pretty cool. What, yep. what are some other life events you might track? Feeding, the pairing, so when the animals get paired, because that's important for me to know. AKA introduction. Mm -hmm. introduction which we do an introduction male, male video because I did do breeding videos. Here's one right here. Yep, <laughs> and then the shed cycles is very, very important, especially when you're trying to track, um, you know, the prelay sheds, ovulation sheds, that kind of stuff. That's what um, we base due dates and timelines off of shed cycles. Yep, yep. And then the last section is just notes, you know, weird things that happen. Maybe it's when I palpated a female, I'm like, hey, this is what I felt. I felt, I felt 27 bumps, and I put a question mark like, eggs or poop, you know? Just things like that for me to process, and so it's really handy when I, when I get a couple of months into this, I can go back and look at my information and go, okay, I know when they fed, I know when they've been paired, I know when they've been shed, I got all these little notes, and I can see the whole grand scheme of the process of breeding a certain female, and that can give me a lot of information about, okay, I actually think that this shed she just have, all the signs show that that is her pre-leg shed. And if you don't know what palpating is, you can watch my breeding video on palpating right here. Yeah. So I guess you have. <laughs> I guess you have that. <laughs> what is the typical breeding season for you? Uh, usually, our breeding season will start around October-ish. That's when we start to feed females heavy and start to do some pairings. Okay. So our first clutch is usually between uh, January and May for, for hatching. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, but usually we don't get eggs until after the first of the year. So we're so very, Mine is very a little seasonal. bit wider. I usually start feeding a little bit more heavily like around the beginning of September. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go through a whole breeding season and typically my last clutches are laid in like July. Yeah. So I do have like kind of the summer off. It's really cool about all these notes is I actually keep a whole stack of notes in the back that are from the previous year. And what's cool is I can go look at females and go, okay, last year she dropped eggs here. Go back a little bit, here's when she had her pre-lay, and look, I fed her heavy this time, this time, this time, and this time, 
And then she stopped eating. Look, she refused four times. She didn't eat for two months, and it's wait, cool. Wait, wait. Let me see this top secret page right here. I just saw. Ooh. Continue. When I have 19 females that could lay eggs, I can't remember all the details on these things. Yeah. Okay, and then when it's time to start cycling that mainland female, how do you change things from food perspective? So if I have a female that weighs like 70 pounds or 80 pounds, I might give her like a 14 to 18 pound pig. So maybe a 25% increase like over that. the mm -hmm. biggest meal you'd normally feed them throughout the year. Yes. And then yeah. does the frequency of feeding increase as well? Absolutely. So usually I'll hit them with a meal, give them a couple of days to digest, and I'll start my intros with my male so she's kind of aware of it, he's aware of, of, of the female. Right after there. that first big meal. A couple of days after. But when you do that introduction, what are you looking for to know if you're gonna leave him in for a couple of days or pull him out right away? I wanna see mm -hmm. how the female reacts. Usually on the first introduction, she'll start doing the thing where she'll wag her tail all over the place, she'll start pissing around the cage and that's communicating, I do not wanna breed with you, buddy. Which is counterintuitive for a lot of people. I think a lot of times people see them wag their tail, they think they're excited and happy that a male's there. Gotcha. But in reticulated pythons, it's the opposite. If you put a male in and they're wagging their tail, mm -hmm. they open their vent, they'll, they'll pee or expel yep. some urate, sometimes even blood comes out. Right? That means get away from me. Yep. Yeah. And so usually I'll let him cruise around for, you know, while I watch in the shop, maybe for an hour, two hours. Sometimes the female can get really violent. She'll start throwing her body all over the cage. And at that point, I'm going to pull him out. Now, sometimes they don't do anything and they just kind of sit around. And so things I like to look for with the male is I'm sure you can go watch one of Garrett's videos. He does a great job of that. But seeing the male arch around the cage, things like that, things that he's excited. Come back. This is the video of them arching as you throw mm -hmm. them together. Yeah, and, and, I'll, and I'll come back and check on them. And obviously, great signs is if he's laying beside her, trying to spur her, or do things like that. Obviously, see a lock. So, by That's spurring, you mean down by the vent, you're actually going to have some little hook shaped, elongated scales mm -hmm. that they can actually kind of tickle the females with. Females. And they, they usually pull against the grain on their scales. Yep and sort of tickle them and move them into place, get them to hold that tail steady so that they can position themselves to copulate. I think the minimum size for kind of your mainland female, you're looking at- 25 pounds. 25 pounds is minimum. what I was gonna say. Yeah. Now, super dwarves on the other end, if you go all the way to the other end of the extreme, let's say the smallest locality is, is generally considered a Carampa Island reticulated python, um, you're looking at probably more like a minimum of four years old, and it might be yeah, something like six. Yeah. yeah, and then size-wise, you're probably looking at something like 2,500 to 3,000 grams yep. as a minimum to start breeding. And I'll just keep this cycle going, uh, and usually she'll just decide that one day, I don't want food, she goes off food, and usually she'll be off between four and eight weeks. Now, do you do anything extra with the male? Anything special with the male during the breeding? Season. Gotcha. Yeah, so the male, you definitely need to watch your sperm count. How do you watch your sperm count? <laughs> I like to give him a three day break between breeding with different females. Um, if I catch him spurring her or if he's arching all over the cage, I'll just write that down. It doesn't hurt to have it in there. And obviously if I catch him locked, I'll write that in there. And I, and I like to grab pictures of that kind of thing. What's the next thing that the female is going to do? She will stop taking food completely. So you try to feed her, but she'll begin her. refusing. And she won't want food. And that's a good sign as far as the breeding goes because they don't want to eat when they're building all their eggs inside of them. And so what I'm looking for is eventually we'll get what we call the uh, the ovulation. And so what it looks like is a female ate a big meal, like I fed her a big rabbit or a pig or something it's like that. it's generally a little bit further down the animal mm -hmm. than where, so if they eat and the lump is right here, that ovulation lump will be like right here. Yep. And a huge thing too is usually the female hasn't eaten in two or four weeks or something like that. And so I haven't given her any food, but she has this big lump in her. So it happens all of a sudden. It's usually within a 24 hour period, you ma notice a, ma a massive explosion in size. Yep. And that's gonna be your ovulation. Now you're gonna re record that when you see Absolutely, it. I'll record it. I'll grab pictures if I can, if I get a good picture. Now they will swell a little bit before the ovulation, but it's kind of looking just like puffy bloated. Yeah. But then that ovulation is very noticeable. Like, a, like you, you said, it, a giant yeah. meal. You know, she ovulates, then what we're looking for between, usually between one and three weeks afterwards, she'll have what we call the post-ovulation shed. 
and when she sheds her skin, it's not exact, but it's usually between 28 and 45 days later, she will drop her eggs. You suspect she's getting ready to lay. What do you do at that point? Yeah, so I'll actually on our cage, I'll write the date that she should lay her eggs. And so when we're getting close to that date, I'll actually throw in a lay box, which for me, it looks like this. It's just gonna sit inside of her cage and I'll put it over the hot spot so that way she can still get in it and stay nice and warm because she wants to be. And uh, what this is for is it's a useful tool that she likes to use usually because she gets to lay inside of a box which makes her feel nice and tight and confined in, in a secure area to lay her eggs. And that way when she lays them, I'm able to pick this up and take it out of the cage. And so I can work by getting the female off of the egg so we can get them divided up in the incubator much easier. You can tell that they lay because they're sitting funny. Instead of like rolling around and, and just sitting loosely or oddly coiled in here, they come in and they're like a vertically stacked beehive all of a sudden. Head sitting on top, coils all the way around, and they've got all their eggs glued together in a clutch. Yep. What do you do for that female to continue that breeding cycle for her? She just laid, you put her back in the gotcha. cage, what's next? Yeah, so she is tired, she is scrawny, she probably hasn't eaten in two, maybe three months. So what I'll actually do is I will, um, sometimes I'll, I'll put a different female that I want to breed down in her cage just so she has that eggy smell, because sometimes, I'm not sure, it might help her to lay, nothing proven. Nice um, little trick. And uh, what I'll actually do with, with her is I'll put her in a nice, fresh, clean cage, doesn't have any egg smell in it, so that way she's not looking for her eggs. I actually because, give her a bath too. Yep, we'll put her exactly. in water, soak her, and mm -hmm. clean it all. Yeah, off. sometimes we'll, we'll soak her in water so that way she can just be really nice and clean because, I mean, she's been sitting around and, and, uh, and you know, just gave birth to a she, bunch of she's eggs. She's planning on exactly. sitting and protecting eggs for the next yeah. three months. I'll offer her a nice small meal, something really small that doesn't even leave a lump. Just because she's tired, she does not want to try to eat anything big. And just maybe once every seven days, just give her a few small meals. After three of those, maybe give her one that's a little bit larger. Um, and so she can get her body weight back up just a little bit to keep them on a nice, even routine. Oh, now what's on this first page here? No, 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 no dude, those are my secret breeding plans. You can't see those. <laughs> no, you, you don't show that. Well, I hope you guys appreciated that, some valuable knowledge from this young man right here and everything that he's going. And, and, and hopefully now that'll help fill in some of my what to do as far as cycling a female and the gaps and the information on our channel. I know it's been overdue. We've done another free tip Friday, but I think this was a really good one. Yeah. So, and I appreciate uh, you opening your book for us and I definitely promise to respect your privacy and all those top secrets. Perfect. Yeah, I didn't even, I didn't look it up. So Good to see you guys. <laughs> we'll catch you next time. Hey, so thanks for sticking around to the end. This is what I wanted to tell you guys. If you haven't already, you need to jump on to Facebook and look up Southeast Carpet Fest for the year 2020. This is kind of like a private reptile breeder backyard barbecue event. They have them all over the country. Here's the thing, guys. Ian Bissell, a good buddy of mine, does all of the campaign contribution handling between he and his wife uh, that actually generates the money for this. Now, they have a sweet t-shirt. All of the proceeds from the t-shirt go to US Arc, which helps keep what we do legal. But they are looking for items to be donated for the actual auction, which is live if you go to the event, or you can follow along on Facebook and actually bid on the items as well. Now, I've already donated a voucher for Reach Out Reptiles, so if you guys want to get you know, a cheaper price on some animals from me next year, that's going to be a great place to go to bid on that. And again, with this one, what we're doing is we're sending all of the, the finances and everything that are raised to NIDO virus research, which is huge, especially in the, the green tree python community, but really something that is affecting all pythons. You guys may have seen the videos where I talk about, you know, doing testing on your collection just to make sure that we're all doing our best to stop this deadly disease. So again, 
all of the contribution money is going to go towards research that's going to save our animals. They are looking for more items to be donated. Now you can donate an animal, but maybe you know a show promoter. They can donate vendor tables. Uh, if you have somebody that you know with amazing artwork, I mean, I know that I am always collecting like awesome artwork and books and things like that. These are some of the best things that go with this. I, I mean, I think literally this book right here, uh, I think I paid $700 or something for at a US ARC auction. So those kind of items go really high. It's a lot of fun to kind of give back to the community in that way. And that's something that you can do that will have a seriously lasting impact. So do yourselves a favor and get a hold of Ian Bissell through this Southeast Carpet Fest 2020 Facebook page and see what you can do. Thanks a lot guys for hanging through till the end. We'll catch you next time. Uh oh, family's here. Yikes, yikes, yikes. Ah!